so we can get started with today's Q&A webinar, Ask the Information Specialists Taking Care of Business. And I'm gonna hand it over to today's moderator. Thanks, Carleen. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Caleb, and I am one of the information specialists at the center. Um, I answer Title I questions, so if you call up for a question um, regarding employment, you could end up talking to me. Today, I'm joined by Carlene and Nancy, who handle Title III questions, which is what we are dealing with today. So you may end up talking with one of them if you call us. And we wanted to take this opportunity to allow people to ask some questions that they've had, and we can answer them in, in this forum. But we have received um, quite a few questions in advance when people registered. So I'm going to start by reading some of those. Um, you can enter your questions, if you have any, into the chat box. And about halfway through the webinar, uh, we'll turn to the chat box and see if we're getting uh, anything live. All right, so let's just jump right into this. And uh, Carleen, I think I will address the first question that we have to you. So this person asks, when people go to courtrooms or retailers and ask for disability accommodations, is this handled the same way as a reasonable accommodation request under Title I? Is there supposed to be discussion or is the person who is asking for the accommodation just automatically given what they are asking for? Um, can, can the business or the service provider say no? That is a good question and a complex question. Um, but let's take it apart a little bit. So first of all, uh, Title I covers employment and you know the right to a reasonable accommodation. That's the language that, that we use. Title III covers um, places of public accommodation. So that's kind of your standard business. You know, retailers would be covered here. Um, to break it down a little further, Title II covers uh, state and local government programs and services. So a courtroom would actually be covered by Title II. So um, using some of the, you know, talking about the distinction in the language here, a reasonable accommodation is something specific to Title I, specific to employment. When you're talking about providing some sort of accommodation to uh, somebody under Title III, what you're really gonna be talking about could either be um, reasonable modification of policy, practice, or procedure, which means that you're gonna do something a little different than you normally would. You're gonna go outside of what you normally would to ensure that a person with a disability has equal access to the goods and services that you're offering. Um, another way that you may assist somebody, though, is through, um, you know, meeting the requirement under Title III for effective communication, which means that you may be providing auxiliary aids or services. You might be uh, reading a label to someone who um, is blind or low vision. You might be providing an ASL interpreter. Um, so that would be accommodating them but in the form of providing effective communication. And then another thing that you might be doing is, you know, falls under that um, requirement for barrier removal, you know, that it's gotta be physically accessible. So they're all forms of accommodation, but what you're really talking about here, you know, it, you're not gonna use that term reasonable accommodation. Um, but all of those methods are ways to make sure that a person with a disability has equal access. Um, in terms of whether or not the person asking um, is always going to get what they ask for, it's um, the quick answer is no. And what they get and how that works is an it depends. Um, even though you're not going to go through the interactive process that you would under Title I, there's still going to be a conversation or, you know, you, you would hope there would be a conversation between the person with a disability and the person providing the, um, the service, right? Um, because, you know, the, the person with a disability might need, um, you know, wh whatever they're needing, 
um, they're going to have to ask for it. Uh, and then the person who can provide it, you know, there's got to be some conversation about whether they can do it or not. They may not always be able to do that. Um, one of the main examples right now is masks and mask wearing or face coverings. Not in every circumstance is a business able to grant that particular, in this case, it'd be modification, a reasonable modification. Um, and right now it's because of, you know, risk of direct threat. You know, there's um, a possibility of transmission of COVID, um, which can be very serious. And so um, not in every circumstance is a business able to say, yeah, you can come in here without a mask and no, it's okay if it impacts everyone else here. Um, it's, it's going to, you know, there needs to be discussion about how can they provide that, um, you know, good or service to them um, because they can't be in the store without a mask, you know, all their alternatives. So can they do curbside service? Can they um, order the, the items online and have them delivered to their home? Um, it, it's, it's a, you know, it isn't a nice black and white yes or no kind of thing. And pretty much across the board in the ADA, it isn't always going to be the person with a disability will always get what their preference is. Um, it, it's an, it depends. Thanks, Harleen. Let's go to the next question here. This is about website accessibility. Nancy, I'll, I'll ask this of you. Um, I'm gonna shorten this one a little bit. So the person says, regarding web pages that have information about services and how to get those services, are the web pages required to be accessible? Um, and the person goes on to say they're asking because um, I guess they've had some people who are uh, responsible for accessibility of, of their technology saying that because Title III doesn't have requirements for website accessibility, that it's not something they need to worry about. So is that true? Well, there's another $64,000 question. Um, that, that also has a lot, a lot of nuance around it and a lot of debate. Um, going on even in the courts. Um, the Department of Justice, which is the federal agency that regulates and has enforcement authority under Title III of the ADA, has said for 20 years that uh, websites of covered entities are covered by the ADA, that they are uh, a method that businesses use to provide information, to interact with the public, and in some cases, uh, to, to directly provide services to the public. You know, we, we go online, we go to the websites, we order products, we take classes, we do all kinds of things. And, and the Department of Justice has been very clear for a long, long time that they believe that Title III is broad enough to reach those those websites that are being operated by entities covered under Title III. Not only the types of traditional uh, businesses that we think of, the stores and the restaurants and and so forth, but businesses that really are just operating uh, in you know online. Now. Not everyone agrees about this. There have been some some businesses that have argued that that the ADA the Title III is not broad enough to reach uh, those those websites, at least in some cases. And the courts uh, across the country have have really split on that question. With some courts uh, finding that websites could be covered by Title III if they have some relationship to a physical location, like a store. You know, if there's an actual store, brick and mortar, and you can go on a website and order the products that they sell there, then Title III reaches that. Other courts have been uh, a little um, broader in their interpretation and have said that even businesses that really operate essentially online can be covered by Title III, and other courts have 
kind of gone the other direction and said Title III really cannot reach reach those uh, websites. Um, so there is definitely disagreement about this, but again, many courts um, have supported the Department of Justice's position that websites um, can can be covered and are covered by Title III of the ADA. So, you know, those I would say that if a business is saying, well, we, you know, we don't think we're covered, there are no standards in Title III to really assess or measure website accessibility. So we, we don't have anything to go by. And, and those kinds of things are, um, you know, in some senses, and at least in some areas, are taking on a little bit more of a risky position in, in doing that. But again, the Department of Justice says, yes, websites are part of, part of doing business. Great. And do, do you know if there are any courts in our region, the Mid-Atlantic, um, that do not agree with the Department of Justice? Uh, no. Off the top of my head, I, I couldn't outline, you know, where the, the split is, um, in, you know, within our region or across the country. But what I would urge people to do is, you know, if you are in business or if you are doing business with a business, I would urge you to sort of check into that. And again, these days, so many businesses are not localized. You know, they're doing business across regions, across the country in many cases. And so they really want to look at the big picture as well as really, you know, where's the home office? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, for this next question, I think I'll stick with you, Nancy, because another technology related one. <clears throat> Uh, this person says, many companies are moving to or have moved to using multi-factor authentication to prevent fraudulent activity. MFA often requires the consumer to receive a text, message, email, phone call, et cetera, uh, that provides a security code. What's the recommendation for people with disabilities that may not be able to receive the security code through one of these channels? What are other companies using instead of MFA? Well, if we're really talking about the, the way that an individual, a customer, would be able to receive a message with that code in there, and maybe they don't have a telephone or they don't have email or, or what have you, I don't think that that's really a disability issue. Um, you know, that's about what does any individual have access to? If there's someone out there that does not even have a, a telephone, uh, you know, then they, and they don't have email, they don't have access to the internet, they don't have a computer, they don't have any of those things. I mean, that could, that could be anyone with or without a disability. Now, I think if, if you're really talking about what does the individual then have to do with that code, to then gain access to the transaction or what have you, that, that could implicate something that might be covered by the ADA. Because if you then have to take that code and put it into a website, for example, like we were just talking about, that could get into an issue of, well, that might be a website that's controlled by, you know, the store or the bank or the, the business and if that is inaccessible if the person can't enter the code in the the field they need to enter it into or something like that because the fields aren't labeled properly so maybe somebody who's blind is not able to you know figure out what to do at that point or something that that could be a potential issue under title three yeah i know what you're saying i I use a screen reader on my phone and a lot of times, you know, you have these things you have to log into that require you to, to put a code, not necessarily MFA, but just, you know, code in general. And the, they're often timed and somebody using a, is using a screen reader on the phone cannot often get, the, get those numbers in fast enough because there's, because there's a delay um, in, in the input, which is very frustrating. And it seems like it would be easy enough for them to just not ha have it, 
be timed like that. So best practice you you would say would just be to get rid of all that stuff, like have no timed, uh, you know, things that you know, always have to put, put the code in. Possibly, or a longer time, or uh, uh, you know, something of that nature. Timeout features are a relatively common problem area for people with disabilities when they're trying to interact with websites and, and, and similar things. Um, and, and, you know, the idea is from the business perspective, you don't want something just kind of hanging open indefinitely um, while people are trying to, trying to use the site. But as you pointed out, sometimes those, they don't give you a lot of time. They give you a really short window of time. And people with a variety of types of disabilities disabilities that affect their dexterity, mobility, vision, uh, all kinds of things might have difficulty with that. So, you know, at least lengthening the time or giving people uh, an option, for example, of another way to, to do something can be potential solutions to locking people out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be nice. Uh, all right, let's go to the next question. Uh, Carlene, I'll come back to you for this one. This person says, we are a small physical therapy office with three therapists on staff. Recently, we got a patient in who's deaf, and they asked for an interpreter for their appointments. They're going to be coming in twice a week, and because we're so small, this expense would be significant for us. Can we use other methods to communicate? Gotcha. So this is a, a pretty common call that we get. Um, so under Title III, you've got the requirement to provide effective communication. And um, sometimes that is going to be in the form of auxiliary aids and services. So that could include um, supplying a, an interpreter, an American Sign Language interpreter, ASL interpreter, pretty common. Um, what the physical therapy office is going to need to do is first, you know, figure out, you know, talk to the person making the request and really find out what do they need. Um, they may think, you know, that the physical therapy office might think writing notes is going great, but um, the person who's deaf, it may not be so great for them. So they're going to want to ask them what works for them, and then how can they put that in place? You know, how can they make that happen for them? Um, so um, often that means, you know, taking a look at things like the complexity of the conversation. So um, the initial physical therapy appointment might be pretty complex. There might be um, discussion about what the plan is going to be, um, length of time, all that good stuff as part of treatment. So that may be the time to have the interpreter present um, or maybe to access them through VRI, which is um, video remote interpreting. But for some of the subsequent actual appointments where they're doing the therapy, there may not be a whole lot of communication happening. And so writing notes or um, using some other method of communication besides an interpreter might be just fine. Um, and, you know, so that, that may lower the cost there. Um, the business needs to remember that they've got to look at their overall overhead you know, so it's not like a one-to-one -one thing where it's based on, you know, how much they're going to get from um, the appointment itself. Um, this can be, you know, for somebody like Amazon, for a business like Amazon, they may have a harder time saying, oh, this is going to be too much. Uh, it's going to be undue burden, um, which is um, significant difficulty or expense. But for, let's say you've got an independent lawyer. Um, we, we had a call about that once. Um, independent lawyer um, who also tends to take more of the hard up cases. He's not really doing the work um, for money and gets a request for an ASL interpreter. 
he's got a tight budget to begin with. It's just him. And then generally, when you're talking legal type situations, that's going to be complex. <laughs> and there could be hours of discussion that's needed. That may cross over into being undue burden. That may actually not be doable. Um, so you've got to, you know, look at all those different factors and, and try to figure out what makes the most sense for everybody. So thanks, Caleb. <laughs> sure. Um, I noticed in this question that they, they mentioned that it would be a significant expense for them. And given their size, you know, it, it might very, very well be. But it seems like it, when we get calls from businesses that, like, you know, are on the small size, um, they often tend to think that the expense is significant. It, how much of this is a subjective judgment? Like, do sometimes a uh, businesses, um, you know, assume that it's too much, and so they don't they don't have to to uh, 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 incur that expense? I mean, that's possible. Um, they definitely need to do their homework first <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. really get an idea of, of how much it's going to cost. I mean, the business does get the final say in whether or not something will be provided. There are tax benefits available for small businesses that may help, um, you know, with, with some of the cost. So, again, before businesses say no, they, they've got to do their homework and see what options there are to try to make that possible. Did, an, mm. did that answer your question? Yep, yep, that did. Okay. okay, Nancy, let's go back to you. So this person says, I'm trying to find information about ADA enforcement at the state and local level. Um, they, they found the Region 4 publication about enforcement laws in their states, um, and they want to know if other uh, regions have done similar compilations or if we can point to other resources where one could find state and local um, in ADA enforcement information for other states in the U.S. Well, now I'm not sure if they're really talking about ADA enforcement on a more local level or if they're really talking about state or local laws. Um, in any event, I mean, the ADA is a federal law, and enforcement of the ADA specifically is limited to federal agencies or people taking, you know, private actions to federal court. And I can tell you that if you want to look for the United States attorney in your area, um, you, can, you can find a listing online. If you go to justice.gov, slash, um, I believe it's U-S-A-O, justice.gov slash forward slash U-S-A-O, that's United States Attorney's Offices. You can, you'll find a, a listing there. You'll see a little map, find your United States Attorney, and you can find the U.S. Attorney that serves your area. They're scattered all over the country. Now, if you're really talking about state or local laws that are similar to the ADA, and all the states and the District of Columbia and territories they have them, they have fair employment laws and um, laws that are similar in many cases to what we're talking about today, Title III laws that address equal, uh, equal access to public accommodations and so forth. Um, I'm not aware of any really comprehensive list of those, but you can usually find them relatively easily by searching uh, civil rights or human rights or something of that nature in, you know, based on your state, uh, even again, localities, sometimes counties or cities have their own uh, civil rights or human rights laws. And sometimes those are really good options for enforcement. Some states or localities have laws that are uh, even more generous than the ADA, and similar you know, disability access and disability rights laws that 
cover you know more broadly, cover smaller employers, cover things more more generously for individuals with disabilities. So you can usually find those, um, but I'm not aware of a really comprehensive list of those agencies. Thanks, Nancy. That's our next question here is uh, has been quite a hot topic. Uh, Carleen, I think I'll come back to you for this one. Uh, this person says, can we ask people for a doctor's note stating that they can't wear a mask? We have a lot of people saying they can't wear a mask because they have a disability. Sometimes they show us little cards, but we think those are probably fake. Okay, yes, very, very hot topic. Um, Hopefully not, not a hot topic for too much longer. Um, so the, we got to go back around to what I talked about a couple questions ago, where we were talking about the requirement to provide a reasonable modification. Um, under Title III, um, businesses need to consider some alternatives to making sure that a person with a disability can get access to their goods and services. When it comes to um, whether or not someone would need to wear a mask covering or whether or not, you know, they, they um, you know, would be able to access the services without one, um, you have to, to consider the nature of the business. So if you are talking about a place that is um, tight, you know, maybe a, a little marketplace, something like that, um, or a hair salon, or um, an area where there really can't be multiple people in there without a mask, that may be something that would not be reasonable. Um, not in every circumstance, again, is the person with a disability going to be able to get their preferred accommodation. And when it comes to um, the pandemic, there is that possibility of being able to transmit um, COVID to others. And so um, it's gonna depend. If it's an outdoor venue, it may be possible to say, okay, we, we can, you know, allow you that accommodation. There's plenty of ventilation, something like that. Um, but um, this is not gonna be doable in every circumstance. And those, the little cards, um, there were some, I, I think for the most part, folks have stopped trying to use them, but um, I think they said they were from DOJ and that it made somebody exempt from having to wear a mask. Those did not come from DOJ. They do not convey any rights. Um, there is not an exemption from having to wear a face covering under the ADA. There is, again, instead that requirement for a business to try to consider alternatives for a person to be able to get the goods and services they offer. Again, curbside service, home delivery, um, something like that. Um, one of the other main differences between Title I and Title III, which I, I neglected to mention before, is under Title I, too, the employer can be asking for some sort of documentation or proof um, that the person has a disability. And under Title III, um, the employer really needs to, I'm, I'm sorry, not the employer, but the business is going to take it on the word of the person making the request. There are going to be very rare circumstances where there could be legitimate business need to ask for documentation. So, um, yep, yeah, that's that's the quick and dirty for that. Okay, yeah, so it, 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 it sounds like the, maybe the focus of the question is not on the right thing. It's not so much about trying to verify the, 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 the disability, but rather, What's the, what's the nature of your, of, your, of your place of business and what and what can you modify? Um. Um, I think so. I think it's still a combination. It, it, it isn't the nature of the disability. There shouldn't be too much discussion about that. But um, still, it's, it's a conversation between the two of them. And then 
you know, what does the person need and then what can the business provide? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we're getting close to halfway. I think I'm going to ask one more of these and then we'll, we'll turn to the chat box and see if we have anything there. Uh, so, so Nancy, I'll ask you this one. Uh, this person says, I took my son to the hospital and he, he has autism and doesn't communicate well. I didn't think the nurses and doctors were doing what they should to accommodate him. They are supposed to provide effective communication. He gets very agitated when people make a lot of noise, and he sometimes says that he wants to hurt the person who is making the noise. But of course, he doesn't really mean it and hasn't ever hurt anyone. What are they supposed to be doing for people like him? Well, that, that's a great question. It brings up a couple of really good points that I'm glad we have an opportunity to, to touch on, because what what we're really talking about here is another example of reasonable modification, really. I mean, um, I think the person asking the question said it's really about communication, it's about effective communication with this individual, and, and it is, um, but I think as Carlene mentioned, when we, when we talk about effective communication in Title III, um, it's sort of one of our little bits of lingo here, um, and that's when we really are talking about communicating with people who have disabilities related to vision, hearing, or speech. And when we talk about things that we might need to do a little differently to communicate effectively with people who have other types of disabilities, like autism, for example, we're really talking about sort of modifying our, our practice, the way we do things, and, and the way that that it needs to be implemented um, in most cases is by asking. Uh, people generally they have to make a request for a reasonable modification. They usually have to make a request for an auxiliary aid or service for effective communication as well. So, you know, initially there is some, the responsibility is on the individual with a disability or, you know, maybe their family or their companions or whatever to really ask specifically for what does the person need? How should these doctors or nurses be communicating with this individual? What should they be doing or how should they be doing that or what should they maybe not be doing? Because this isn't something that uh, in many cases, you know, businesses, uh, people in, in businesses, you know, they're not gonna no, they're not going to automatically, number one, necessarily recognize or understand if someone has a disability or what that disability is or what that means and, and what to do. So in most cases, you know, people need to, need to make a specific request. I mean, it sounded like in this scenario, maybe the individual, the individual gets agitated, um, they get upset, they might make threats or something like that. And so obviously that, that could get to be a little bit stressful for everyone concerned and, and certainly businesses, even, you know, healthcare providers um, don't, you know, they're not gonna have to let people threaten them or whatever, but they do need to consider requests and consider things that they can do to make that communication, to make that interaction more, more effective. Um, so now you, you know, in certain types of, of settings, you might expect the people that are in, in the business there, the employees of the business to be a little bit more aware about disabilities. But, you know, generally, again, you, you have to sort of ask for what you need and then work with the business to, to make that happen. Yeah, you know, I've heard um, that there are some healthcare providers that have uh, like zero tolerance policies about uh, like anything that might be said that, that could be perceived as a, as a threat, you know, and then they just, and they won't serve those, uh, anyone who, who says something like that, um, that makes them, you know, concerned um does it matter if if a person has a di a disability that you know might con contribute to why they might say things that might you know seem in 
inappropriate in, 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 in that context? And do they have to do something about that? You know, even though they have these rules that say, you know, we, we don't tolerate any threats whatsoever. Well, I think a disability, you know, do, does make a difference or could make a difference. I mean, again, this is one of the this is one of the things about the ADA is that it really requires us, all of us, um, to to try to find the balance and find solutions and work things out. And this is what so much of the ADA is about. It's about trying to find that balance between what is a reasonable modification and and what is not reasonable. Um, so I think it, it, it does, but it, it so often comes down to that communication, that interaction, and we keep circling back to um, it really is so important. And, and again, that it happens um, as soon as possible, you know, because again, you don't want something, uh, you don't want an interaction to go beyond, um, you know, the point of no, no return. Uh, you want those those modifications to be considered and and put in place so that things don't reach a point that you know they can't be retrieved. So that's where it's important for individuals with disabilities and and their advocates and so forth to you know be be advocates and be self advocates. Um, ask for what. Ask for what you need. Um, communicate. Be part of the solution, and and that's on all of us. Whether we're the business operator, whether we're the the customer, the ADA is sort of telling us to talk to each other and try to work it out and and find that balance. So you know, a, a policy or a rule like we have no no tolerance for for threats. You can understand that the businesses don't want they don't want threats they don't want violence they don't want these kinds of things in their in their businesses that's not unreasonable but very often and it sounds like in this scenario this individual maybe says some things that could be perceived as threatening but the person who knows him says you know it doesn't really mean that and he doesn't follow through on it um, so. But the business doesn't know that, right? That so that needs to be communicated. That needs to be. Could, hey, could we all? Could we lower our voices a bit? Could we talk one person at a time? Could we please, you know, do these things, whatever those things might be, so that we don't we don't have those things happening. The ADA is sometimes I call it the double edged sword of the ADA because it doesn't always tell us what to do specifically in a situation but the upside of that is it lets us figure out what works in all the different situations that come up in the real world so it, it allows us to ask for what we need figure out what we can do and and come up with solutions yeah i think that's that's really good Add uh, an advice. You know, there there are things that can be done um, to kind of preempt those kinds of situations by just trying to find out ahead of time, like what does what does a person need if they need if they need anything. Um, all right, why don't we turn to the chat box? See if there are any questions there. Uh, Car Carlene, do we have any questions so far? Do yes. Thank you to those who right. submitted questions. Um, first of all, let me pull this up here. Um, the first question is, a small private college has an auditorium um, that they uh, allow to be rented out for public events. The auditorium is not accessible. Um, what should the college do to inform the public that it is not ADA accessible? And are there any best practices with this situation? So <clears throat> I, I can start, Nancy. Maybe. OK. <laughs> um, so you know, if it really is a situation in which um, it is not going to be possible to improve the accessibility of the auditorium, I mean, ideally, that would be the first thing to try to do. Um, 
but if there's there are structural reasons, um, cost barriers, that kind of thing. Um, you know, one of the, the first places we say people can put information, put it right on the website. Um, just let people know. This happens, um, often we get this question from medical offices that are, say, in a house. You know, you see that a lot in more, uh, you know, small town communities. And um, they have stairs going in, and there really isn't a good way to make that accessible. So, um, so I, you know, I say put right on your website somewhere front and center, you know, here are the physical limitations of this facility, um, just so you know. <laughs> and at least then that way uh, someone can make an informed choice um, about it. Um, I, I, um, it, maybe the person who asked the question can offer a little bit more information about when they say it's not ADA accessible, are there specific aspects of it that aren't accessible, or um, are there alternatives, you know, for people to be able to get some sort of access? Um, if you're not able to, to give any information, those, those are some things to, to think about. And, and then, Nancy, you want to go ahead and... Well, I would just add, um, because, yeah, we get this sort of question a lot. We talk to a lot of folks about these these kinds of issues. And when, you know, as Carlene is saying, go ahead and, and put it out there. Let people know, you know, what, what your limitations are or what you have, what you do have. I always think, you know, tell people what you do have. Um, and, and a lot of uh, businesses kind of react like, well, that doesn't seem like a good idea to me at all. That just seems like I'm just asking for trouble and then somebody's going to sue me and, and everything if I go ahead and just put it right out there to say I'm, I'm not accessible. And I can understand the concern. It, it seems like you're, you're putting, putting out front to the world this negative sort of information. But... Um, at the same time, you know, there's something to be said about being open about what you have and what you don't have. A lot of people with disabilities would much rather find out, uh, you know, hey, I can't come to this auditorium because I use a wheelchair and I can't get in there, uh, than to buy a ticket and show up and find out after you're there. Um, so, and again, I, I would urge businesses, tell people the positive. Maybe this auditorium has a really great assistive listening system. Um, and maybe it has some features of accessibility. I think it's really good. And this is something that we talk to hotels about a lot because they have some very specific requirements under Title III to provide information to the public so that people can try to figure out if they want to make a reservation there before they make a reservation and travel across the country and show up <laughs> for their um, you know, accessible room and, and what have you. They have to provide a lot of pretty detailed information out to the general public. And, and I think for any kind of a business, if you know you've got limitations that are not going to be overcome because it's, it's not achievable, the structural limitations, whatever the case may be, um, I, I think sometimes it's better to tell people about that ahead of time. Go ahead and, and be upfront about it. The person who submitted the question says, um you know, with regard to the accessibility, it doesn't have um, specific seating for wheelchairs and the stage is not accessible. Those are, those are certainly some, some limiting factors and it might be a really old property uh, where getting access to the stage or getting some, you know, wheelchair seating locations in there would be, would be really difficult to do. I mean, obviously we can't speak to the specifics, but those features, the lack of those features are going to be very limiting for some people. But again, 
not everybody, which is why I, I think that more specific information is more helpful. There might be lots of people with different types of disabilities who could still use that facility. People with arthritis or people who maybe use crutches or things that could, could use that facility. And if you just put, it's not accessible, then, you know, the people in the world, what does that mean? Right. Right. Yeah. Older facilities create a lot of tough um, issues under Title III. We know that under Title III, you know, there is an obligation to try to improve accessibility in older buildings, but that's not always possible uh, for a number of, of reasons. Sometimes there are structural limitations, sometimes there are cost limitations, which could change over time. Sometimes there are historic features of properties that can't be changed. And so there are a lot of issues around access in uh, existing buildings. And remember, it doesn't hurt to try to get creative, you know, and think about or investigate what some other places have done for workarounds for some of these things. Um, you know, so uh, it's possible to even have some suggestions or, or to offer um, some other methods for, you know, still still trying to have it be a little more accessible for some for some folks. You know, it, it's not necessarily, a, oh, that's it, forget it. You know, sometimes it is, but sometimes they're, they're really, so, some folks have been really creative with this stuff. So do, do a little homework, you know, and, and see if there are workarounds. Um, we've got one more question that came through here. And, oh, we, we have a couple more actually, that's great. Um, so the next one says, what would be equal access to telehealth for an individual who requests closed captions or chat due to being hard of hearing when the current platform for the telehealth services does not support chat or a closed caption option? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, if the platform doesn't support it, then, yeah, I mean, you have to wonder about that. Most platforms would, would support some way of, of, of doing that. Um, so maybe they need another platform. Yeah, I mean, you know, the medical provider should really look at another way that they could provide the telehealth services, you know, because that, that means that there's there could be, especially with COVID right now, some places are still just doing telehealth visits. That That's a pretty big barrier. <laughs> So and and are, are you guys saying that that's something that the provider is obligated to do that they, they need to provide telehealth via a platform that um, has captioning? Well, I, what I what I'm understanding is that they're providing telehealth. It's an option for people. Um, and depending on what that looks like, if it's, you know, like a video online video sort of a thing, is it? you know, on a, on the telephone. I mean, you know, if it's, if it's a telephone call, then use the relay service. You could use captioned relay service. Um, if it's, if there's a video component to it, there may be a way to tie those, those things together. Um, but I mean, this is, they obviously have, have an obligation to business, assuming that the, the health care provider is covered by the ADA. If it's private business, covered by Title III, you know, if it's a county health department or something, it's covered by Title II of the ADA. Um, so if they're, if they're covered, then they have an obligation to make the services they are offering and providing accessible. So if they're offering telehealth appointments, they have to be for everybody, right? It has to be an option that's available to everybody. And, you know, the technology is not going to be the problem. We have the technology. There's a way to do that. It's just a matter of figuring out what, what they have, what technology, what equipment do they have available? What can they use? You know, the technology's out there to do that. 
Um, so, Caleb, do you want me to to keep? Yeah, um, go ahead and ask the next one. Questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now we did get one here, and um, but you know you, you'll you'll see why I pause here in a second. I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. My local park that has many community events and hosts baseball games every weekend does not have an appropriate accessible parking area. I made the city aware many times. Two years later, the only accessible parking is um, parking, it says here, on top of rocks. What can I do next? That sounds like a question that's more about Title II maybe, but that's okay. We can, we can maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, if it's a, uh, a city park, that's, that's Title II. Title II covers state and local governments, states, counties, cities, towns, uh, everything they do. So there are a lot of similarities between Title II and Title III. There also are some distinctions, but uh, a, a city operating a city park there, city recreation facilities and so forth, you know, they have obligations to make their, their activities accessible. And if they're offering parking, you know, a parking lot, parking facility, then there should be some accessible parking in there. So uh, if they've been made aware of the problem, I guess, they've known about it for at least a couple of years and they're not, you know, taking action. Um, there may be a way to file a grievance with the city itself under the ADA. Um, could file a complaint, an ADA complaint with a federal agency like the Department of Justice, or maybe if the city park gets money from the federal government, maybe a complaint with the Department of the Interior, or something like that. There are some options of that nature um, or, or a private lawsuit and again i always urge folks to uh, interact with each other and try to solve things locally it sounds like they tried that they tried to talk about the issue and it doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be working so so that's a shame people with disabilities who need accessible parking should be able to go to the go to the baseball games like like other folks so but that sounds like a title II issue um, yeah, we also received a couple um, other ones in advance that probably are Title II as well. Did you want to address those um, just qu just quickly to kind of underscore that point, Nancy? Oh, uh, sure. What else did we get? Um, so, so one person was asking about public housing authority that only allows clients to use the bathroom if they make an appointment, but it, but if you if you come in just ask a question or drop off paperwork or something like that. Um, they don't consider that having an appointment, and so you can't use their restroom. And they say that there's not one in the lobby, um, so it's not it's not available to the public. Well, that really is kind of an interesting way to draw the line between who gets to use the bathroom and who doesn't get to use the bathroom. I don't know that I've ever heard <laughs> that one before. You have an appointment, you can use the, the restroom. If you don't have an appointment, you can't use the restroom. But I, I will say this, and this would be the same really under Title II or Title III. The ADA doesn't say you have to provide a public bathroom. Very often, building code does. Very often, your state or local building code will say, if you operate this type of a facility, you have to make a public you know, restroom available. Um, or you don't, or whatever. But the ADA doesn't say you have to provide a restroom, but what it says is if you provide a restroom, you have to make it available and accessible, you have to make it accessible and available to people with disabilities on a basis that's equitable to people without disabilities. Now, of course, with access to facilities, restrooms or any other type of facility, we have the the structural accessibility question, which means we have to look at, is the building brand new, newly constructed? Has it been altered? Is it just old? Has it been standing there for 40 years or 100 years? And those can be factors 
but as, in terms of whether you allow the public to use your restroom or not, it's that's not really an ADA issue as long as you make it equitable. So usually it's either available to the public or not. You know, it's employees only or it's everybody. Um, but as long as the distinction isn't based on disability, then then it's not an ADA problem. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we got a couple more as well that were not quite Title III. It looks like there are more Title II. Uh, I don't think we'll have time to to get to those. But um, so, Carly, I'll just turn it over to you to kind of wrap things up. Oh, I, yeah, I was just going to say we have about three minutes left, but uh, probably not enough time to to crunch one more in there, I guess. So, um, but I, you know, I I want to remind everybody out there that um, you know what the ADA centers do is we provide information over the phone, via email. You can contact us anytime. It is anonymous, totally free. Um, you know, if you have follow-up questions to anything that we talked about here, absolutely give us a call. The number is, um, you can call us toll-free at 1-800-949-4232. Um, you can call us locally um, if you are in, um, you know, the, the Mid-Atlantic region, 301-217-0124. Um, or you can email us at ADA, um, adainfo.org. Um, and for those of you who um, paid for a certificate of participation for today's session, the code word to get your credits is business. Again, the code word for today is business. For those who paid for a certificate of participation, you want to check the reminder email you received about this session for instructions on obtaining it for this webinar. And we ask that you please email the code above to ADA training at transcend.org by 5 o'clock Eastern Time this Friday, April 23rd, 2021. And one last time, the code word is business. And we want to thank you so much for joining us today for Ask the Information Specialists. Um, we love your questions, so call us, email us. That's what we're here to do. We're here to answer, you know, ADA questions or help you sort it out if it's not. Um, and again, we are the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. Um, there are actually 12 different um, centers across the country, so you can reach an ADA center um, whether you are in Washington, D.C. or the state of Washington. So, um, and Nancy and Caleb, thank you both too for, for uh, you know, joining us. You know, we had our, our um, uh, ADA center team answer questions. And um, Caleb, do you have anything you want to add? I do not, but thanks for all your great answers, guys. And all thanks right. for all your great questions, folks. Yes, thanks again, and um, enjoy your day. <laughs>